A Pagan's Pilgrimage by Llewellyn Powers. Dedicated to my brother Theodore, in memory of those pilgrimages he has taken me, in moods of piety and impiety, of gravity and of gaiety, without so much as setting his foot beyond the fields that lie around High Sheldon. Preface in undertaking my pilgrimage to Palestine, it was my original purpose to make a simple chronicle of those accidental happenings that overtake a traveller who leaves his native land. I wished to record the impressions of what I heard, smelt, tasted and saw, taking as a model for my method the writings of Tom Coriat, who, 300 years before my own generation, was a familiar figure in the village streets of Odcombe, Martok and Montacuti. Meddling with theological matters, as I have done in The Cradle of God and in The Pathetic Fallacy, was not included in my first intention. Where you least look for it, there starts the hare. In the present volume, I am once more back on safe and familiar ground. White Nose, February 1930. Chapter 1. The Grave of a God. There is perhaps a certain simplicity in the desire we have to visit the burying places of great men. Century after century the earth has gathered them into her belly, and it is possible we imagine to catch from these cradles of treasured dust moments of high meditation. We used to be told when we shivered in a particular way that a goose was walking over our graves. The adage, even in our childhood, jerked our minds into an awareness of the inevitable fate of our mortal bodies. In a transitory moment of disturbing consciousness, we recognised that the hour would come when our skulls would also break asunder like earthenware pots, and our ribs also would give in, and our bones also settle themselves for their long drawn out dissolution. No son of woman, however blithe, however taught with damaging self counsel, can evade this final culmination. It is part of a universal auditing. And in the end, the worms are our scriveners. If we incline to indulge this passion for visiting the burying places of great men, it should be no matter for surprise that the perplexed and pious generations should have laid such store upon seeing the burying place of a god. How should it be otherwise? The planet continues its even, uninterrupted flight round the sun, as though in a supernal trance it preserves its mesmerised revolutions. Light from an infinite distance gilds it round grass-grown flanks, illuminating at dawn the underside of the seagull's wing. Darkness falls in diurnal repetition, and once more the body of the earth moves with blinded, unobservable sureness through the haughty night. On high moorlands, in hay-growing valleys, Carefully constructed human habitations project like tiny wormholes on a downland, and at intervals in the banks of rivers the lights of great cities stain with their radiance the dimness of the outer atmosphere. And everywhere men, minute and brittle as grigs, go about their occupations, thoughtless and bewitched, each one of them presently to be wrapped tight in a shroud. Only at long intervals are men born capable of understanding. Small wonder, therefore, that we should be easily persuaded to gape over their sepulchres. The religion of Christianity is, in itself, so startling a departure from the normal that the most obstinate among us can but contemplate it with astonishment. When we consider the other so reasonable gods before whom human beings have prostrated themselves, gods free, powerful, and untraduced, or gods malignant and given to malfeasance, it is a matter for surprise that the abused generations of the last two thousand years should have raised up out of their unconfessed longings so tender a figure as that of Jesus. For it is to know Apollo, gleaming, arrogant and godlike, that the religious bend the knee in our time. Though obscured by the grossest sentiment, the praying populations have found expression for a yearning deepest consciousness itself. 
cannot be doubted that there is a morbidity in the Christian notion. And yet, what an interesting portent it is, how unexpected, brought into existence by nature so that half the world without difficulty has been persuaded. The words of Jesus, and the life of Jesus alone, have made this strange interlude possible. A few scattered sentences of sure insight, of childlike illumination, carry forward the sublime fable. His thoughts, preserved by the ignorant, have had a power not dissimilar to that exercised by radium in the physical world. They slide sideways. They are inevitable, irresistible, struck, as it were, by a miracle out of nothing. From my youth, the mysterious figure of Christ has puzzled and allured me. The tales that were told me about him projected themselves into my vision of existence. They were hard to assimilate. As the years passed, I came to understand that the faith sprung up about his name was but a product of the deluded preconceptions of the Middle Ages. Yet what a curious epoch it marks in history of the conscious thought of the Western world. Childish chat though it must seem to any intelligence of tempered wisdom, yet it was derived spontaneously enough out of the world's suffering. It was a subtle method of escape from pain, and the intimidations coincident with the conclusions to be derived from the massive grossness of matter. To those of us who rely upon the senses for the appreciation of life's dispassionate mystery, it would be hebertudinous not to let this chance command our utmost attention. We open our eyes upon the earth. On frosty winter nights when duckweed ponds bear, we look out in an unpartisan universe. In the twinkling of an eye, our winter moons and our summer moons are gone, and all is darkness for us again. Would it not be adult headed in us then not to turn over a stone or two? Not to lift up a rhubarb leaf? Not to examine the fir cones at our feet before we depart hence? Fortunately, in the nature of things, we have been given every opportunity to indulge such pastimes. For... Say what the Barclians will, from a human point of view, matter is stable. It is subject to ordered laws. It is impotent to vanish. Throughout my life, this simple fact has been a case of increasing surprise and satisfaction to me. Life under observation is found to be so feral, thrown up out of causes neither to be explained nor understood one would have expected its physical manifestations to have had a bias towards the untrustworthy. This is not so. Where the tree falls, there does it lie. Though our honeysuckle lanes are thronged with phantom faces, only the autumn can pilfer the sweet fragrance of the flowers. From the first, the human mind recognised in matter a trap. It twisted and contorted itself to find an escape. It confused the issue with words. It left facts and trusted to fancies. It bent itself backward, screwing its head upside down like a paralytic canary. Its conclusions have been false. This is no dream within a dream. There are no miracles, because all is a miracle. There is no magic. Because all is magic. Yet, however we be, or wherever we be, on the earth's surface, doubt it not, we have an actual objective position in time and space. At any instant it would be possible from the ultimate borders of the universe, finite and unbounded, to discover in, our, in the flesh our actual bodies. A yellow-haired gypsy swarming up an apple tree after mistletoe could be found. An aproned grocer selling a paper bag of flour in an atmosphere of paraffin and pastry has a positive actual existence and could be found. It is a fine spiritual exercise as you sit in a turnpike ditch at night time to drive your imagination out into the void of the firmament. It will return to you. 
come back to the familiar nettles and rusty blotched dock leaves, a creature more courageous by half. It will have learned a new scholarship from the night. It will approach with more confidence the room of death, the room of birth, the bed of delight and love. More than ever will you be aware of your own identity, of your own mobile body, light with blood and breath. And under the instruction of such a heightened consciousness, you will be alert to look around you with new eyes, and to listen with an improved pair of eland long ears. In an instant, your congenital drowsiness will have left you, and you will know that your hour is here and now. It was under the influence of just such a mood as this that I first decided to go on my pilgrimage. Amid all the tumult of the years, tradition has preserved safe the exact spot where that far-off sepulchre took place. What madness then not to visit before I died that rock of white colour and a little meddled with red. What used to be alive under the sun at all if one did not take advantage of such privileges? How do I know that Jesus was not actually a god? And if so, I should indeed be a fine dolt never to trouble to look for traces of his earthly sojourning. Why, in such a case, a dinosaur's egg in the Gobi Desert could not have half the interest of the holy sepulchre.